today, I'm really excited to introduce Tim Marlowe, who to many of our preferred audience in court, are known as uh, the man who's often around town, in fact, around the world, recommending great exhibitions and wonderful content for our website. We always thank him very much for his insight on those. But Tim has actually, he's got a job as well, of course, and he was recently appointed as the Chief Executive and Director of London's Design Museum. But arguably unique to Tim, having started the role in January of this year, COVID-19, of course, approached. So it was a bit of a baptism of fire, Tim. And I really want to know, where are you now? And what is, what is the kind of thing that you're focused on? And particularly just looking at the theme of these videos, we're talking very much about artist therapy and collaboration. And arguably, this is a really, a really great time to be thinking about that as well. So um, let's start with where you physically are right now. I'm at home in East London, actually, Ollie. And um, I didn't think I'd be spending my time getting to know the Design Museum intimately from East London, but thanks to the joys of digital technology, I I'm, I'm succeeding to a certain extent. Occasionally, my exercise routine allows me to cycle past the museum, which looks unspeakably beautiful with the Spring Blossom and Holland Park looking wonderful. And then the museum sort of closed. It's, it's tragic, yeah. really. And then, and then, I mean, let, let's talk about that because you know, I think that d design is one of these things that kind of really surrounds us everywhere. And you know, having looked at your website, you know, it ranges from. I was listening to an interview with Jeff Mills this morning. So, you know, design really can be anything. It can be soundscapes. It can be sort of utilitarian objects as well. But to, to, to what extent does not being in your physical space? And I should mention that with your unbelievable and reinterpretation of the building in, in uh, Kensington Gardens, Holland Park Gardens. You know, this was a, a museum building that was so anticipated. But tell us what you're doing to keep your audience really uh, engaged and, and, and educated from, uh, from home remotely. Well, we have a whole digital program, the Digital Design Museum, which I think we rolled up pretty quickly. And I mean, that ranges from a whole load of uh, workshops for families, children. I mean, I think there's one you could build a rocking horse or make a rocking horse at home to making coat hangers with things you find in the garden. Um, to the design dispatches that we do every weekend where I talk to the great and the good uh, across the design spectrum about their cultural landscape now and also how they got to where they got to and maybe what the future holds. I mean, you say um, that design can be almost anything and in some ways that gives great license. You know, I've been able to speak to you know, Eve Baha, uh, Bella Freud, uh, Paul Pressman, I've got Stella McCartney and David Ajay lined up, Anya Hindmarsh, uh, Roxander. I mean, there's, there's many, many people. Um, but of course, the remit, the thing that inter is inter interests me is where design intersects with our everyday lives or with humanity and without sounding pompous or Churchillian I do think that where we find ourselves now um, it will be a combination of science and design that um, ensures yeah. that we either get out of it successfully or um, yeah. you know we encounter more problems so there's a really serious aspect to that as well as the whole overlap between design and, 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 and creativity and the arts in general which yeah. is about expressiveness and uh, imagination which is also important too. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking about that a little bit actually in preparation of, of our meeting and of course it was just announced this morning that there's going to be this app which is going to be tried in the Isle of Wight, um, which is all about sort of, you know, distancing in this time of kind of COVID lockdown. Um, you know, but likewise also one thinks at moments like this of great architects like Shigaru Ban, for example, who are, you know, wonderful globally renowned architects, but who responds, you know, almost to, 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 to an architect, to a designer, to kind of global issues and problems like that. So. I mean, do, do you feel that in spite of the remoteness, and of course this is not something any of us design ultimately, that you can find different ways of getting traction, that you know, new audiences are coming to the museum as a result of it too? Yeah, it certainly is the case. Uh, what I'm discovering is that, which I think I knew, but it, it's really reinforced it, that design is so varied and there are so many different tribes. I mean, the, you know, the world that you, you, and, you inhabit and, I, and I've come from, contemporary art, is broad, but there's certain things that seem to un, un, unify everyone, or unite everyone. And I know that the audience from the Royal Academy, where I was artistic director, although people's taste and interest are massively divergent, there is still a core of people who are interested in an Oceania show, in a Duchamp Dali show, in a Jasper John show, in a Picasso show, in a Tracy Emin show. Whereas design, architecture, graphic design, industrial design, new technology. Um, these, are, these are really uh, varied practices. And whether or not mm -hmm. there, there's an overlap, it's something I'm, I'm looking at. I mean, that's the role of institutions. People start to trust the museum to, to, to showcase what they think is interesting. But it does give the opportunity of 
of, um, of looking at completely different audiences. So the exhibition we're about to open when we can reopen, which is electronic, yeah. which looks at design and club culture and electronic music from Kraftwerk to the Chemical Brothers. I mean, think of the tri the musical tribes that will come to the exhibition, or we hope will come yeah. to the exhibition yeah. there. Uh, so it is really interesting, but you know, the online programming and the way that we reach out, all of all institutions are trying to do this. It's still a means to an end. I mean, of course, the, the, the end should be communication and inspiration and showcasing what's interesting about the world that we that, that, that we inhabit. But I, I really believe more than ever locked up here that communal experiences of physical objects or at least uh, experiences that are physically shared will get more and more important once people's understandable concerns about social distancing or physical distancing uh, get less as scientists and designers find a solution to, to that problem and it makes me right. just want to go out there even more and sort of see things together with other people I think it's really interesting. I'd love to know a little more about, I mean, the exhibition that you just mentioned as well, the one about sort of almost sound architecture, but specifically looking at electronic from the Crawford to the Chemical Brothers. Um, when you think about something like this, you know, arguably this is a very oral experience as well. I mean, you know, one, one can download a Spotify playlist, for example, with Crawford or the Chemical Brothers for that matter as well. How, how do you physically bring these things to life in a way that conveys what it's like to go to a craft work show, for example, or what it's what it's like to go to a you know a Chemical Brothers All Roads East Festival. In a sophisticated, imaginative, and inspiring way is in answer to your question, Ollie. But um Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I'd have thought nothing less too, frankly. <laughs> and, and I can say that because it's, it's it's a show. I mean, it, you know, it, as it opened with it, it was due to open two and a half months into my tenure. I can hardly take credit for it, although obviously I will if it's if it's a raging success, as it will be. Um yeah. it's interesting because because uh Electronic music obviously comes from uh, instrumental design and the technology. So the technology, mm. uh, as pioneered by, I mean, many in the 20th century, but you know, Kraftwerk in particular, the starting point of this particular kind of music. That's one aspect. But the other is um, individual cities. So we look at Detroit, we look at Berlin, we look at London. Um, there's also the whole graphic design culture around the music, the way it's promoted, the way yeah, that shoots are promoted. Um, and then, of course, there is the physical sensation of different clubs, the, that kind of the, the experience of sort of being being immersed. And, and without giving too much away, because the proof will be in the physical experience or and the oral experience of the exhibition. There's this kind of journeying. I mean, I have to say it's a brilliant subject for an exhibition. We're very unlucky in the timing of it because, of course, you know, uh, yeah. clubs are intense, intimate, sweaty places where all manner of body fluids are exchanged wittingly and unwittingly. And that's not what people yeah. sort of will want when, when things um, roll, roll down after lockdown. But uh, there's still ways of, 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 of um, showcasing that. And of course, you know, from your perspective, um, I mean, I'm not pigeonholing you in, in, just in, in contemporary art, but contemporary art's a fairly porous activity too. You know, people like Andreas Gursky have, uh, have, have obsessively looked at and chronicled aspects well, and explored aspects of that club scene. And of course, that, that'll be in the exhibition too. Yeah, I mean, I certainly, certainly, I think it's a great analogy. I mean, when, you, when one thinks about Gursky May Day video, or for example, you know, even going to things like the May Day Festival in Berlin and seeing people dancing around the Brandenburger tour to Carl Cox or something. I mean, it's a, as you say, it's, it's a coming together. It's a, it's a sort of social coherence and almost semi-religious too. I mean, the DJ is almost like a kind of papal figure too, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, there's, and there's a brilliant uh, a sort of tension between uh, what is uh, designed by uh, you know, DJs, uh, musicians, uh, cl club entrepreneurs and also how people self-organize or self-design I mean there's a lot of uh, street yeah. up as well as uh, top down in, in this yeah uh, just sort of zeroing back into the, the, the world of, of designers specifically um, what I'm really interested in and, and as you mentioned I very much sort of come from a sort of contemporary area or world where in some senses there is a kind of sense of being definitive around a certain group of artists or, or practices it, it strikes me that with design as well, and looking back over some of your recent exhibitions, you know, whether it was Stanley Kubrick or whether it was the Azadine Elias show, or whether it was the Ferrari show, all of which I saw, um, to, to me it kind of demonstrated almost an incredible elasticity of expertise amongst your cur curatorial staff as well, which is far, far greater and pluralistic arguably than a kind of than a, than a, than a smaller or rather an institution with a much smaller kind of brief as well. How have you enjoyed this transition 
and I should say to some some people watching, Tim is stranger to the world of design, and um, you know, put together an incredible rental piano show at the Royal Academy as well. And then over the years, would have got to know David Ache, for example, who has regularly crossed that barrier right between architecture and art. But what have you enjoyed most of all about getting to know your new curatorial team and their ambitions for the exhibitions they're going to be working on? It, there's, there's a very interesting, uh, and I hadn't quite foreseen, parallel with the curatorial team at the, um, at the Royal Academy, actually, which is there's a lot of individual expertise and passion and enthusiasm for certain subjects, but there's a kind of agility and an unegotistical sense of wanting to work with external experts in the realization of whatever exhibition project it is. So when I mean, I've thrown down some gauntlets on exhibition ideas that it'd be worth at least exploring, I can't go into too many details, although if you're gonna ask me in, in, in a minute what I'm reading, you might get a sense of where I might be looking, but anyway, that's, that's another issue. Um, but, and I'm really impressed about their capacity to know how to approach subjects, how to research subjects, how to find out who knows about the subjects, and also this lateral uh, um, understanding of where design impacts on whatever the subject is. I mean, you know, there's certain subjects, uh, fashion would be one of them, where you, you might start with a, a sort of pure design angle, certainly furniture mm -hmm. design or architecture, there's an element of that. But actually, Kubrick, you mentioned, Moving to Mars was the show that was on when I started, which was an extraordinary exhibition, where all manner of collaboration with institutions like you know nasa imperial college and so on were there and you got this really coherent narrative about what mars had meant to human beings what happened when we actually discovered it what happened when we put a, a, a craft on mars and where that the implications of that take us as a as a species and it's really it's so it's the smartness and the understanding of what questions to ask and how to explore something that, that i really admire in the team that i've been working with for all of three months and when it comes to kind of shows like the Mars show, and actually now looking forward a little bit to the Prada exhibition that you're doing, I mean, obviously, you know, Mutual Prada is very much kind of alive. She's going to be, in some ways, is, is that show going to be maybe even be a survey of her work to date? Or are there going to be other, other ways? Or can you bring in outside curators to help interpret what she's done over the years? Um, it's a collaboration with Prada, and actually, right. my, pre my predecessor, Dan Sujic, is, is the is the lead curator on that. With actually, with, uh, with Susanna Frankel and Alex Eagle, who are, who are there. So, there's a, this good curatorial team, great curatorial team. But what's interesting about uh, first of all, Mucha Prada, as you know, is an incredibly talented visionary woman. But she, and although her name, I mean, it was her grandfather's company originally, and then, but she, she's very reticent about pushing herself forward as a kind of creative ego or genius, but she has that kind of talent. So there's a kind of cat and mouse game as to how much of Mucha's vision we can actually showcase yeah. explicitly. Uh, I mean, implicitly, it will always be there. But also, Prada is one of the, uh, of, of the, um, I was going to say fashion houses, brands that have always, well, let's say in the last three decades, have reached out in different ways across the arts. So the Prada art collection, the engagement of artists, the yeah. engagement of architects, particularly uh, OMA, Rem Koolhaas and Herzog de Muron, in the way that they showcase their work from the fashion shows, but also the buildings, the shops and so on, has been really central. So you get this incredibly rich uh, territory and I just want to pay tribute to someone I'm sure you knew well as uh, 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 I didn't know him as well as I wanted to do but I, uh, you know, I knew him well enough to have dinner with him it was uh, Germano Chalant who's so important sure. for Absolutely. the evolution of Prada and, and Mucha's foundation and it's yeah. a tragedy that uh, that, he, that he's now no longer with us I mean he wasn't involved directly <laughs> in the show but yeah but it, it, anyway just it, it, let's mark Germano's passing with you know respect yeah. and, and uh, I mean he, he was a, he was an extraordinary man um, but the other thing about Prada is, which um, I knew but didn't know quite how obsessively brilliant they archive things. So they have this amazing archive uh, of every button that's ever been used. I mean, sorry, wrong, uh, of a, really? of an example of every button, not every, literally every wow. button. Wow. Okay. Uh, a swatch of material, every yeah. bag, every shoe. And so okay. at the heart of the exhibition, without giving too much away, we have this sense of, of the material stuff that has oh, made fantastic. Prada over the last uh, right. three decades or so. And, and is, is this the first exhibition that's ever come to grips with? Has she ever agreed to do anything like this before? No, I think this is the first, absolutely the first, yeah. That's so yeah. exciting. Yeah, yeah, isn't it? Uh, that's really awesome. Just to show that this is live and that you and I are so au okay fait with light, natural light, daylight. The, um, 
the sun's got his hat on. I'll just. I, I thought maybe that was the Apollo 13 space satellite, just, just shining a light directly through you, godlike. Yeah, to, but, you had a halo around that, you for a second there. Yeah, sorry, I have that aura, of course, but yeah, <laughs> somehow I need to kill it. <laughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to to move, you know, just, just sort of closer to home, obviously, apart from this sort of moment of enlightenment behind you. But um, just talking about artist therapy and, you know, at a time like this, I think all of us have, you know, responded to, to situations in a, in a very different way. And I, I think we find ourselves equally in very uh, unique situations of, of either self-isolation or with our close family and friends, uh, hopefully having the benefit of, uh, the sanctuary of a library or a great book or you know a tv series or something like that but if i if i could just sort of you know maybe um ask you a little bit more about what are the, what are the things you're thinking about but maybe even more specific about artist therapy and you know clearly you're somebody who we all know is being incredibly positive and and, and you know equally adroit talking you know or writing about art for really across millennia in fact the very first time that i met you was in 1993 and was talking about Anthony Caro, the new generation sculptors. Um, you know, so, so, so I think it's fair to say that everyone knows that you have a great platform of understanding and knowledge to, 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 to fall on. But at this very specific time, what, what is it that you're finding the most amount of solace in? It's funnily enough, <clears throat> um, I mean, I'm reading and I'm trying to watch films, although I have a 10 year old, so I tend to watch things that he wants to watch too. So we do quite a lot around the around sport broadly. But I, I'm finding I'm finding a lot of solace in art. I mean, like, you know, I have an eclectic uh, uh, collection of art, not a great collection of, uh, at all. But I because I was thinking the other day I was asked I was I was asked to um, do a, a small video uh, um, for around Easter time on the theme of hope. And for some reason, I just opened a, a, a Constant, John Constable catalogue and seen a beautiful reproduction of The Leaping Horse, um, that great painting at the last of the Six Foot River Star paintings that um, I yeah. realised I'd lived with almost every weekday when I wasn't travelling for the previous five years because the Royal Academy have this. Uh, and I realised how much I missed the physical proximity of great art. And then it started making me look again at the art that I've got at home. Um, because um, often the art that we live with, if we can't recycle it, it the danger is sometimes it just becomes a kind of backdrop or a kind of terrible furnishing. And um, you mentioned Anthony Caro, and I have a beautiful table piece by Tony Caro uh, that he gave yeah. me, but it's not here. So, you know, here we go again, I'm missing that. But right. I was looking at a drawing yeah. I have of his from the 1950s when he was just making that breakthrough from um, studying uh, he'd studied at the Royal Academy schools he'd done engineering at Cambridge he'd seen Henry Moore and Moore was already starting to mark I mean quite literally make marks on Kakara's drawings and it was part of that at that time when he was experimenting with clay um, uh, and breaking free of Moore but still clearly uh, attached to him and um, he made a series of sculptures which he said were exploring what it was like to be inside a human body. And I discovered this beautiful figurative drawing I have of his that somehow seemed to experience the human form from within. And it just made a different kind of sense to the Cairo that we all know and respect, which was the man who pioneered, you know, welded yeah. steel, assembled abstract sculpture. So looking at that and, and, and drawings actually have always been um, a passion or interest of mine i suppose in some ways and that's what links me to design and architecture too that creative people often explore and express and work through ideas through drawing and i'm fascinated by artist drawings as well as architects drawings and i was looking at a beautiful little sicker etching that i have of a of a mother uh, just i think it, it was done in 1889 it's a very early sicket etching of a, of a of just of a scene yeah. in the streets in, ha in, in Houndsditch where a mother is just sort of doing up the final button on a young girl's coat and it's such a universally recognizable gesture and so brilliantly and beautifully and deftly and effortlessly rendered by sicket so i was just looking again at that i suppose we have time to look more slowly at art if we have art with us when we're you know forced to stay in our home so i've been looking quite hard at that around me actually yeah and, and then also i know you're very much a, you're a keen cyclist and um well, one, once everything opens up and once you're allowed back on your bike um tell us a little bit about the places that you really want to visit around london but but more specifically are there any design spaces or architectural spaces which, which you're really excited about you know the, these are the ones which are going to define the next generation of architects and you know, amazing buildings on the London skyline. Well, it's an interesting point, really, because um, bikes are great ways of, I mean, I'm doing a bit of cycling around the city now when, I, when I'm allowed 
here as part of my exercise routine some are interesting ways of seeing the city because you uh are, you're, you go fast enough to, for the landscape to change but you're slow enough for you to take it in although obviously you have to be sort of road aware and the state of london's roads were bad enough before the lockdown i mean now kind of potholes and go yeah, exactly. so you have to be careful about where you look um yeah. I, you know what i it's it, it, the idea of doing I, I, mean, I yearn to get out the city actually i yearn to see the london skyline from the, from a distance um not that i don't love this city but i want to see it uh, um from way out out of out of the city i want to get out the city um but it's um it, it's uh, um i mean in, interesting to to uh to think about that and um i don't know i i i thought of um i mean i, I tend to go around cultural institutions so you know seeing the seeing what's ha happening to various i mean i'd love to go and um uh, see the the i mean i, I went briefly to Regent's Park the other day and went past Lord's Cricket Ground where the first stage of Chris Wilkinson and Jim Eyre, Wilkinson Eyre's uh, new stand which is going to be half done but usable was going to be half done and usable this summer and then completed next summer which is the stand which is the Compton and Edrich stands that will be framed by and partly framed the brilliant uh, media center that uh, Future Systems designed. It's nice seeing well, that, that was one coming up. Yeah yeah I mean, I, I've always, you know, in fact, I've only got recently to know that building intimately. I have a son who loves playing cricket, in fact, at Lord's Cricket School. But, you know, I always knew about that, called the media centre, the future systems one. And, you know, I've always loved that sense that sport embraces modern architecture so, so poignantly like that as well. Well, it's interesting that Lord's, you know, the, the, the most establishment of all sporting institutions, pretty well, or at least one of them, um, uh, has such visionary architecture i mean you know a oh, yeah. visionary that yeah. michael hopkins you know they've, they've, they've always appointed good architects to uh, and it's yeah. a great amalgamation of different of different uh, styles although i remember amanda levette uh, once told me that when she and her previous uh, partner jan kaplicki who were future systems were designing that um, i remember uh, uh, doing an interview with her in that building when it just opened and me saying to you know um, I said, did you ever, the pavilion is opposite and women weren't allowed in the pavilion. And I said, um, wow. yeah. how did, where did you have your meeting? She went in the pavilion. And I said, how did you manage to get that? She said, hello ground. Yeah. No, she said, don't be so stupid. She just marched in, which is brilliant. <laughs> so, so Tim, um, before we finish, a, a really big thank you, but I, I couldn't help but ask both from a professional and a personal perspective, um, how important is it that, that um, Stanford Bridge gets rebuilt by Herzog tomorrow? Well, I have to say it, it's essential uh, that this happens because um, respectfully to Tottenham and Arsenal and Wembley, we need a landmark stadium in our country, and certainly let's say in our capital city, designed by, um, by major architects. And the Stamford Bridge design, notwithstanding the fact that you know, it's my club, that fantastic brick uh, construction that they that, that they designed was extraordinary. I don't know if it will happen, um, but the collaboration between um, uh, the Design Museum and Stamford Bridge would be something even more easy to um, to uh, generate, which obviously is one of my aims as director of the Design Museum and a Chelsea fan, because they're just around the corner. And funnily enough, I'm reading a book I've been meaning to read for a long time, which I can recommend to anyone who's interested in systems, structures, tactics and the cultural history of a sporting activity it's jonathan wilson's inverting the pyramid oh, brilliant. there it is fantastic yeah there it is and thank, if thank you're, you if you're you knew i was going to ask you about that yeah but if you're wondering where i mean nothing's nothing's of course set set in stone and the one of the things you have in lockdown is the chance to think about the kind of exhibitions you might want to do in the future um, and obviously uh, it's very early days but something around the culture of design and football wouldn't be a bad subject would it no, I think that sounds a really brilliant subject. Well, listen, Tim, thank you very, very much for taking the time. I think we, uh, we, we're we absolutely enthralled to hear about everything you've been up to and also the future plans for the design museum. We, we commend to everyone watching, you know, Tim's brilliant directorship, but also how fantastic to have the museums back up and running. And we're really excited about all those exhibitions that you've mentioned today, Tim. Thanks so much. Thanks, Ollie. And thank you, everyone.